Now let's talk about the other sequencing technology we're using. This is a 454 machine made by Roche. The first step is the creation of a library from the input DNA. Just like in Illumina sequencing, the DNA to be sequenced is broken into smaller pieces and adapter sequences represented here in red and green are attached or ligated to the ends of the input DNA, which is shown in gray. The adapters have tags on the ends that allow us to separate the pieces of input DNA that have adapters on both ends. We then heat the strands to separate them and mix the DNA with permacoated agarose beads, PCR mixture, and oil. When the tubes are vortexed, the beads are suspended in little drops of water containing PCR reaction mixture in a sea of oil. This is called an emulsion. This is just like salad dressing. We call the little droplets microreactors, and we want every droplet to contain a single piece of input DNA and a single bead. How do you make sure that only one piece of DNA is in the droplet with the bead? We use a dilute solution of input DNA with an excess of beads to make sure that most of the microreactors contain only one bead and one piece of DNA. Then we amplify the input DNA on the beads. This occurs in a PCR machine. When we go through the PCR temperature cycles, amplification occurs in each microreactor. The surface of the bead is coated with primers, much like the surface of the alumina flow cell is coated with primers. The adapter on one end of the input DNA anneals to the primer on the surface of the bead, and the polymerase and solution extends the sequence from the primer to make a strand of DNA that's attached to the bead. When the tube is heated, the template strand is denatured from the bead. That strand is copied within the microreactor, and the cycle continues. In the end, millions of copies of the input DNA are made in each droplet. Why do you use an emulsion instead of regular PCR or bridge amplification like alumina? Remember, the input DNA is in many small pieces, and all the pieces have a different DNA sequence. Each of the beads has a novel piece of input DNA. By suspending the beads in oil, we create water droplets, each with a single bead, the microreactor. A different PCR reaction occurs in each water droplet, so we can have millions of different PCR reactions occurring in a single PCR tube. Emulsion PCR allows us to perform many PCR reactions in a small volume of reaction mixture and serves the same purpose as spreading the reactions out over the surface of a flow cell. At the end of the PCR cycles, each individual bead has a million copies of the input DNA attached to it. We heat to separate the two strands of DNA. Then each bead has a million copies of single-stranded template DNA ready for sequencing. After we centrifuge the tubes to separate the beads from the oil, we're ready for the next step. The next step occurs in the 454 machine. First, we take the beads and run them over a pico titer plate. What's a pico titer plate? Pico titer plates are much like micro titer plates, but there are several million smaller wells created by etching a glass slide. The wells in the pico titer plate are just large enough so that a single bead with template DNA fits into each well. Then we add a second solution that has smaller beads with enzymes attached to the beads. These smaller beads fit into the wells around the DNA beads. Then we're ready for the sequencing reactions. The pico titer plate is loaded onto the 454 and attached to tubes that pump liquids with the additional needed chemicals over the pico titer plate. 454 sequencing uses a technology called pyrosequencing. In pyrosequencing, we're observing the addition of a base by detecting the release of a pyrophosphate. First, a primer is added that binds to the adapter sequences on the free 5' prime end of the single-stranded template. Unlabeled normal nucleotide bases are added. Note that there is no dye and no terminator block. The unlabeled nucleotide triphosphate bases are run over the pico titer plate one at a time. G, then A, then T, then C. If the next base in the template DNA is C, then the polymerase adds DGTP to the extending strand. Remember, 
deoxyguanosine triphosphate or DGTP has three phosphate groups. When polymerase incorporates DGTP into the growing DNA strand, one phosphate group is used in the phosphodiester bond to make the sugar phosphate backbone of the DNA and the two phosphate group is released. This two phosphate group is called a pyrophosphate. Other enzymes on the beads in the picotiter plate react with the pyrophosphates. The blue arrow represents sulfurylase, which reacts with the pyrophosphate to make ATP. The red arrow represents luciferase, which reacts with the ATP and luciferin to produce a signal in the form of a flash of light. Where does the luciferin come from? The luciferin is stored in the reagent tubes and is pumped over the picotiter plate with the nucleotides during the reaction. Luciferin and luciferase were originally discovered in fireflies. The flash of light produced by luciferase is detected by a camera that's mounted next to the plate in the 454 machine. After the flash of light is observed, the excess nucleotides are washed off and the next base is run over the picotiter plate. Each nucleotide is run one by one, A, T, G, and C, with a wash in between. The camera records the position and timing of each flash of light. 200 cycles are carried out with all four bases run after another during each cycle, resulting in a read length of 350 to 400 bases. The 454 beads use a primer from only one end of each DNA fragment but you can create paired in DNA libraries that have an adapter sequence attached to two pieces of DNA that are found 2.5 kilobases apart in the genome. Sequencing of these paired in libraries can give you more information to assemble sequences from novel genomes. Does this machine have any problem areas? Overall, this machine gives very good quality sequence. Base substitution errors are very rare because you're only running one base over the picotiter plate at a time, and the nucleotides don't have any modifications that might interfere with recognition by the polymerase. However, a problem occurs when there are many of the same bases in a row. If there are three adenosines in a row in the template strand, then the polymerase will add three DTTPs all at once when DTTP is present. If there are four A's in a row, the polymerase will add four DTTPs and so on. This will release a larger amount of pyrophosphates and lead to a brighter flash of light. If the number of bases in a row is more than six though, the brightness of the flash will not be proportional to the number of bases added, so long runs of a single nucleotide can be misrepresented in this sequence data. This is called condensing a homopolymer run. Overall, there are 3.6 million wells in each picotiter plate, and most wells contain a single bead. The camera has recorded about 400 bases of sequence data from each well. Up to 400 megabases, that's 400 million bases of sequence data with very few substitution errors can be obtained in an eight hour run. We do at least two runs a day in each machine, which means we get 800 million bases per machine per day. That's a little over a quarter of a human genome a day, which means it takes about 3.75 days to get 1x coverage of the human genome. 454 sequencing is pretty good, but Illumina generates more sequence data faster. Why do you use both? Well, not every project needs as much sequencing power as the Illumina technology can provide, so the 454 machines are good for smaller projects. Also, as I've mentioned, the two technologies have different problem areas, so some projects will work better with one technology or the other. The shorter read lengths of Illumina sequencing technology can mean it's a little harder to assemble the data. This means we have to sequence to a greater coverage with Illumina machines. At least 20x coverage is necessary, sometimes as much as 50x coverage. This raises the cost and decreases the speed of finishing a project. 454 gives longer read lengths, so analysis can be slightly easier. 
Both next generation technologies are significantly faster and cheaper than the old Sanger sequencing pipeline, and we use Illumina 454 and Sanger sequencing separately and in combination for sequencing projects at the Genome Center. Now that we've learned about the technology used by the machines, I'm going to take you to the director of the Genome Center, Dr. Rick Wilson, to talk about new applications of the next generation sequencing technology. Thanks, Dr. Shadding.